All righty, we're good to go. Good afternoon, everybody. All right, happy to be here. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about Confluence Service Mesh Journey, uh, how uh, they adopted Service Mesh and what kind of uh, challenges they, they faced and what kind of technologies and the kind of integration they use with, uh, with, with Istio. All right, so um, if you guys have any questions, do not hesitate at the end. I uh, hope this is going to be uh, a good one. All right, first, quick intro just uh, to the speakers today. My name is Adam Saya. I've been, uh, tr I mean, I've been with uh, Solo for about four years and a half, mainly focusing on service mesh. Uh, with me, Cody Ray. Uh, I mean, we have lots of similarities. Uh, new dads, <laughs> you guys can see. Uh, same aerodynamic hair. <laughs> well, to be fair with you, we went to lunch right now and we just definitely felt the, the cold outside. Um, all right, so, Cody, um, today we're going to talk about what's the reasons for a service mesh. We're going to talk about uh, compliance, workload identity. We're going to talk about multi-cluster. And then uh, we're going to talk about mainly some small hiccups uh, being encountered. And at the end, we're just going to talk about what is possible in the future in terms of enhancements. With that being said, Cody, is all you. Cool. So this is our journey, which means I'm going to tell you some stories about how we actually got this thing funded, right? I literally, since 2020, had a wiki doc saying, I could use Service Mesh for this use case, or I could use it for this use case, or I could use it for this use case. And every time I'd say, ah, that's a lot of work, until it came to compliance. And we were starting on our FedRAMP journey, and we're like, no, 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 we're, we're done. This is going to be the, like, the, driving, the driving motivation to do this. At the same time, we had an internal directive from our CISO to get us from perimeter security to zero trust security, service to service authentication. And we did. We're, uh, we're an infrastructure as a service provider, right? You run Confluent Cloud, so tens of thousands of Kafka clusters, all right, more than that, tens of thousands of Kubernetes clusters with lots of Kafka clusters in them. So we have to do this at very, very large scale. Um, and obviously all this comes back to how our customers use us and making sure that we can provide all of their very sophisticated networking needs. So I like to err on the side of transparency, which means this is a very ugly slide because I took it directly from what I presented to our executives whenever I wanted to pitch them this thing. It doesn't have to be pretty, you just have to be able to show them the numbers. So I wanted to show you like the ROI perspective that we use to present this business case in the beginning. And then we'll kind of dive into some of the technical stuff we, dis we discovered as we went along with like, how does Istio work with Spire integrations, which is gonna be a big part of what we're talking about. So if you ask our executives, they think we have like you know, three or five services. We have hundreds of services that they have no idea about. So they're like, oh, it'll be easy. We can, we can have our, our security team audit the communications to make sure they're secured. Just go update the applications. That's very easy if you have three services, right? You have three communications. But this is a common torch problem. You know, in one, coffee, one Kubernetes cluster, you have 100 services. That's almost 5,000 connections. And you want to have your security team audit all of those consistently, because with FedRAMP, you have a continuous monitoring program. You're checking that all the time to make sure there's no plain text traffic accidentally added. So yeah, 5,000 different communications. No one wants to do that. So I showed them this slide, explained a little bit about you know, how you have these sidecars and yada, yada, yada. They didn't care about that. But then I told them how it would make our migration much easier. Right? If you have all of these different services, you don't want to have to have them speak plain text and TLS on different ports. You've got to go talk to 40, 50 teams to get them all to say, oh, sure, I'll add another port. I can do that. It's never going to happen. We tried to get 10 teams to make a change, and they're like, no, we've got other priorities. So how can you do this for me? Right? Platform time, this is where we come into this. So we said, oh, we can do this using a service mesh and take both TLS and plain text on one port. Then you don't have to coordinate nearly as much. We'll, we'll drive it. Just, just you know, take our tiny PR changes for your Helm charts, and we can go from here. Everyone's super busy. Let us do this for you. So this was, this was our big pitch. So not only can we make you more secure, we can make you productive. So often in our world, how many have felt a big challenge about like a tension between productivity and security? I feel it constantly, yes. I think most of us in the room have felt this tension. This is a place where it's a very, very clear win that you can be productive. You don't have to have all of your teams update all of your services. You can have a central team kind of take ownership of this. And you can actually get much stronger security, right? Having to audit every single connection individually is a Herculean effort that I wish on not my worst enemy. 
So it's transparent. It can be done for you. You can support arbitrary services if you, if you really, really love microservices and believe that you can use 12 different programming languages with a, you know, 500 engineers. I question that, but if you've done it, this will actually make it possible. And you can centrally monitor and enforce and secure all this. So secure by default, everybody loves. So this is something that our, our security team loves, right? We know exactly how many communications, how many different requests are going over plain text, how many are going over TLS in our case. Uh, you can see which services are not communicating over plain text. You can see which services on the bottom right we're getting requests, but they're unknown because they don't have a client. This was during our migration period. So we were able to start tracking down. You don't even know who's calling your services before you go through this journey. So you have to track them down and onboard clients one by one, which was the migration challenge I was talking about earlier. So this sort of central observability is incredibly powerful. And it, it buys a lot of trust and love with your security teams that you, you, know, you struggle for. You want, you want them to, to feel loyal to you. And you're like, I'm watching out for your back. So Whenever I need some sign-offs or some waivers, you can help me out, you know, scratch each other's backs. So this is, this is how you kind of get buy-in, is give them this, the, the warm and fuzzies that we are centrally enforcing this and making sure that you can see that it's being enforced. And then how we took the next step, once we had securities buy-in, like this is the right, the right approach for us as a company. How do you get the execs to say, sure, we'll go sign this contract, we'll, we'll do all these things, we'll, we'll fund this project. Uh, this is literally a slide that I presented with some, you know, slightly modified numbers to be a little easier. Just 100 services, which is not a ton of, in a, a large enterprise in, environment. Say, here's the reasons we think it'll take about six weeks if we're going to go update every single service and migrate them individually to use TLS to talk to each other and on and on. That's about 12 and a half engineering years of effort. I don't know about you, but my execs do not like anything that ends with years of effort. So we had to say, actually, we can do this with two and a half engineers. We added an a L2. By the way, we also called out. It's like one L4, senior engineer, or senior two at my company, and a couple of new grads, right? And then a partnership with my man here. And we're able to do this. And our estimated savings of this is not only are you delivering it faster, but you're also saving about three and a half million dollars versus having your own engineers do all this. They're like, all right, here, go and do it. That's, that's all I needed. I, I wanted that buy-in, and I was pretty good to go. Compliance. So this is where we kind of all started with this, is starting with FedRAMP, you have to do this thing called FIPS. If you don't know what it is, you not only do you have to use specific algorithms, you have to have particular modules that have been blessed by the US government. And you have to confirm that every binary in your system is using those modules. Obviously, that's a pain. Yeah, and basically, at the end, uh, from issue perspective, and just making sure that the binaries are uh, built a certain way, using the right cryptographic identity, but by the end of the day, just super boring. You just, you just MTLS. Uh, that allow provide this sort of compliance. So the next, the next business requirement we had is not only encryption and transit, but we really wanted to make sure that if service A called service B and service B called service C, we had the same identity through the entire thing. Like we know when service A calls service B that it came from service A, and we have like this chain of trust effectively, right? So there's this CNCF project called Spire. How many of you have heard of Spire or use Spire yeah, already? Yeah, good question. Awesome. Oh, that's pretty good. That, that is pretty good. Uh, so this was the, the, what we started using in a very centralized way. Again, very large scale deployment. So like many projects, you find a lot of hiccups. Yeah. You want to talk a little bit about Spire? Could yeah, uh, I mean, a quick intro, I'm pretty sure like a lot of, uh, like it's your users, basically one of the, like based on the previous uh, talk, one of the main reasons for service mesh is the identity, right? So defining identity to every single workload and attesting and making sure that A can talk to B and attesting that actually A is A. Um, there's Istio ships, uh, an implementation of, of Spiffy, uh, which allows us to do this. But then when you talk about identity at scale, uh, then you need something like Spire, which also implement uh, Spiffy. What Spire will allow us to do is to have uh, a mechanism to have a chain of attestations, right? So it, it will make sure that, first of all, this, uh, the agent that runs on certain workloads, either a VM or a node on the Kubernetes cluster is attested to actually attest its own identity first with a Spire centralized server. And then this, this agent can now 
kind of carry this chain of attestations with workloads within every single node or VM to make sure that the workloads themselves are basically attested and making sure that they have an identity. So TLDR, again, and there's a lot of material on Spire, but TLDR is Spire, uh, Spire is, is just managing identity at scale is very, very valuable uh, for companies. So if we uh, think about um, and maybe we can even like uh, skip this one because I, I talked about it a little bit. This is important because this is actually, uh, it, it's given the example of implementing Spire at the scale of a company like Confluent. Yeah, so this was very complicated. The Istio, the, the Spire that comes with Istio, I love it. Works out of the box. My security team said, no, we don't like that. The automatic registration of workloads in the Spire, no, 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 that's, that's not secure enough. We're going to make that manual. We're going to build our own process around it. Um, whenever you have all three cloud or the three major cloud providers and a lot of different trust domains, this is what you end up with. So we have both federated spires and nested spires here. So you can see like AWS root with regional spires in each of them. It gets very complicated and our security team gets very specific about what they want, like right down to the format that they want the, the SVID, like the spiffy ID to come back in, which was baked into Istio and hard to change. So these are the things that once you start hitting a certain scale, you start finding the, the rough edges of where projects don't play super nicely together. Yeah, and, and, and if you go back and map this to the previous slide, right, uh, you would have federation between multiple, even cloud provider in this case, uh, and then every single cloud provider have a centralized, where, a centralized way of, mm -hmm. you know, just delegating uh, down to ser Spire servers where are close to the workload. So the next, the next slide is mainly this, right? We have one Spire server managing trust and identity of multiple types of workloads. In this example, we have a lot of uh, Kubernetes clusters, it can be VMs, it can be something else. Mm -hmm. uh, but actually, this is also a super important question, right? Like, okay, let's say we define the identity of the workloads across a company like Confluence, right? Multi-cluster traffic is required because A, you're going to have to navigate to B, maybe the service is in a different cluster. How to go and carry this chain of trust and this workload identity across the board? Right? I need to make sure that uh, my workload in cluster A that has this certificate can go and talk to workload B in cluster B uh, and, and making sure that this uh, trust and identity is, is verified. Um, this is actually without some using a, a mesh gets very complex. For example here, and I think that was a previous implementation, uh, we had two clusters, cluster A, cluster B, but what the pods or the service need to do is to obviously originate TLS to the other cluster through an ingress ga uh, gateway that terminate TLS, but you still need to carry the JOT. Uh, in, the, in the JOT, you have the, the, the identity of the workload, and from there, you verify the JOT and then kind of route it to, to the destination. You see it, it's pretty, pretty complex, especially that you know, you're pushing that on the workload and on the application itself to do this, but at scale, you'd like something that carries the identity across the board without this need. This is why uh, if we follow, uh, you know, uh, obviously Istio multi-cluster, Istio just allows us to use and integrate, well, obviously the two clusters have their, the, the Spire integration, they already have the, the workload attestation, they have their certificates, but what is important here is there's no TLS termination, right? Mm -hmm. It's just TLS passed through across the board, allowing us to carry this identity from cluster A and cluster B, first it's, simplifi it's simplified in terms of like I don't need this workload to terminate TLS and this complexity and JOT and all these things, but also is more efficient because I don't have TLS termination that is costly, especially at scale. And at the end of the day, this is what our security team wants, right? You can't put RBAC policies against a gateway, which is your upstream if you do terminate. So you need to have that identity all the way through so that you can actually do authentication and authorization for real, not with infrastructure components, but with business level components. All right, let's talk about some hiccups adopting this. So uh, one of the, the problems we faced uh, early on is, so let's say now I integrate uh, like uh, a pod that now, uh, so it's basically the pod starts and it needs to request in the workload, you know, the identity with, with the Spire agent. 
one of the problems we, we faced is if, if the spire agent is not ready, and let's say the, the socket is not there, Istio used to default by, you know, default to starting their own, you know, starting the SDS and doing basically the, 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 the Istio implementation. Which this caused some weird issues where sometimes some workloads are running with the identity that Istio provides and some are running with the identity that Spires provides. So the fix was to uh, make a change in Istio to make sure that the, it doesn't, uh, you know, uh, doesn't fall to the, the previous way of doing things. So always you force it to, if the pod cannot connect to Spire, don't start the pod. That's it. I don't want another identity. Uh, yeah, another another uh, hiccup here. Another issue is again back to the socket, right? If uh, for for some reason the socket exists, so in this case, okay, well, the spire, the, the we are not starting SDS server. That's great, but in the same time, like the the socket is irresponsive. For some reason, this will block definitely the condition on, you know, doesn't let the, uh, the, the, the server start, doesn't let it work. That was a problem of the, the socket itself not being created correctly. And using the SPIFI CSI driver resolved this issue. So it's kind of now mainstream to if you want to use Aspire, I'll definitely recommend, recommend using the, the CSI driver. Um, yeah, so. That is also a problem during, and you'll see kind of the theme here, that <laughs> the, the, the problem is always the connectivity, connectivity between the pod itself and the, the Spire agent for, for attesting, um, attesting the, you know, the, the, the workload. So in this case here, uh, the, the, uh, the, connectivity, the Spire agent was in a bad state, but there's no way to say, hey, we needed a way to say, Spire agent, if you're not alive, just, uh, just uh, restart or, or uh, you know, going back to the liveness and the readiness probes. Um, any other thing you want to add? I want to quickly conclude on the possible enhancements. Yeah, I mean, the, when you have thousands of nodes and hundreds of thousands of pods, these things happen. And when it might, happens once or twice, it's fine. Once you're running at scale, these happen constantly, and you're just in uh, an operational overload. So fixing these things was critical to us to actually even GA on our, internally. Um, so being able to figure this out and add the new configurations into Istio made a world of difference so that we could actually unblock our, back to the business reason, we could unblock our actual testing for our compliance. All righty. So what if I bore you one more time with ambient mode? I'm <laughs> just kidding, but we talked about it the previous, in the previous, uh, previous talk. That was an intro to, to uh, ambient mode, so I can skip that. The reason why I want to focus on it now is that Spire integration, like all the hiccups we had with sidecars and the Spire agent, that is something that actually also ambient will help us solve. Why? Because, uh, well, first of all, you don't have, so you don't have that workflow, life, that, that life cycle that the pod itself is actually need to be injected by the sidecar, sidecar need to mount the, the socket, all this is not there anymore, right? You have only the waypoint, uh, sorry, only the Z tunnel running on the node, and the Z tunnel is doing all this for you. So what we needed to do is to just make sure we, uh, oops, we make uh, sure that the, there is, we did some changes actually even in Spire to make sure that the, the Z tunnel can integrate with, with Spire in a, in a safe manner, because in the previous implementation uh, was, there's this delegate API that just completely removed the, the attestation workload from the Spire agent. Now it's safer. Z tunnel is just there, and just we still use the same attestation mechanism in the Spire agent. So this is very safe. But what it helped us to do is definitely to alleviate all the issues we had previously, right? Now we don't have all this complexity, so uh, Ambient's gonna help a lot there. Uh, I wanna conclude with a quick, uh, you know, in terms of performance, also something we can look into. Ambient is definitely more performance and we can have, if you have, especially a, a simple, kind of simple use case you think about, it, right? They just want compliance, they just want TLS, I just want um, identity and I wanna make sure A, service A cannot talk to service B. And that's how, going back to make the mesh boring, make the mesh super easy. I don't have to care about it. It should just provide me these capabilities. In that case, Z tunnel just running on the nose, allowing us to provide this identity is, is very crucial and also very performant at scale. Um, 
All right, I just want to make sure that uh, you guys are aware. If you want to start on focusing and learning more about Ambient, there is ambientmesh.io that is now live and allows you to focus on just Ambient. And it doesn't have the, the kind of, you know, it's kind of a more simplified way to consume, to consume the, the docs. With that being said, this is the end. I mean, That's I want it. you to close that. Yeah, we, we have not adopted <laughs> Ambient, but we've been watching it. We're, we're super excited to see it come out. Uh, my team was a little too scared to be that early adopters, in all honesty. Uh, but we're, we're very excited about being able to move to a sidecarless sling. We, we host data workloads. You can imagine that performance, tail latency in particular, is everything. You're at scale, which means every one of those CPU and memory hours add up across tens of thousands of clusters. So we're, we're very excited to be able to move in this direction and see the industry go this way. Perfect. And again, Ambient is GA. <laughs> uh, so if you guys have any, uh, you know, it's going to be a huge favor if you guys give us a review to see how we can improve next time. <clears throat> With that being said, this is the end of the talk. Actually, I want you, I want more applause for this guy to come here on stage and talk, talk to us about, uh, you know, someone using Mesh. We're always here to talk about our, our, uh, our problems as imp like implementing the Mesh, but a user talking about the problems is, is actually, you know, definitely goes a long way. Thank you so much. Thank you. So we still have a couple of minutes for questions, it looks like. We got one right over here, yep. Uh, you've got a mic behind you. Oh, I have a mic. I know, um, you didn't need it last time. So when your security team went to you and said, hey, we want you to use Spiffy, uh, like what was your reaction in terms of like, this is adding complexity without adding security? Or did you come around to finding that it really did help you with security? Uh, this wasn't a place that I, I pushed back on a lot. Um, they had a pretty sophisticated model around like the trust domains they wanted to see, which is why we have that, that federated version, right? So like we have the trust domains for like our production environments and our pre-prod, they all have different trust domains. And then you have like the, you know, the, you always have pipelines that go between environments. So I kind of understood conceptually what they were aligning to. The places that it actually really bit us were on some other teams that were doing uh, like a single account with both production and pre-production workloads. If you have a Spire agent, it can't, it can't work there, right? You have to either one trust domain per Spire agent. So they actually had to do some pretty big refactoring. Um, they pushed back, but from our perspective, we kind of understood the reasonings. I saw another go up a second ago, didn't I? Oh, okay. Over here. Um, maybe thinking a little bit more conceptually, but um, and, and this is me just trying to wrap my head around Spire and, and Spiffy. Um, are there ways to implement the, like the Spire APIs? So let's say I have a, a client outside of a cluster and they want, I want to do zero trust with them, but I don't want to have to do a multi-cluster configuration. Is it possible to leverage those APIs or are there libraries for say JavaScript or Java, whatever it may be? Or are you guys mostly focused on, hey, we're just, we own our clusters and we federate everything ourselves? Uh, right now, we own our clusters. From, a, from what's possible, I bet Adam can speak more to it. Uh, but yeah, we're, we're very much on using what it is. I think conceptually, this is like the secret zero problem, right? You need some way to attest that, that this thing is the thing it says it is. And for our security purposes, and the reason that we, and we went down this route, is we wanted pod level security, right? They're very, very strict on least privileges. I don't care, we have multiple pods running on a node, do not use that node's permissions. Which isn't something you can get natively from any of the cloud providers. So that's, that's where we'd have to go. If you're going outside of like a Kubernetes cluster where you can do a token exchange from a service account, then you might have to get creative. I don't know what the framework would be. Uh, if, if you think about, uh, I mean, there is like VMs integration. There's a lot of you know where you can just use use that type of integration to attest the trust. But ultimately, it's back to this point, right? Like, if you if it's just a TLS certificate, that's one way TLS. It's not very much, uh, you know, the ID ID across the board. If you want to define identity, what is the most important is not the TLS certificate. Is attesting the workload that's actually. Mm -hmm. Who is right? So and and that, I don't think there's an easy way to answer that with just a client. 
and one of the things that we actually took the next step to is like if you're making an API request to us, we've got to the point where we can say for this given API request, this identity can only call like these three out of, you know, you have a big, my, uh, big service that has 100 APIs, they can only call these three. So that's the level that you, we really want to get to in terms of granularity, even not even service to service, but like inside of a single service to inside of a single service. Yeah, uh, going kind of back to the first question, uh, it kind of, uh, you know, there was a lot of ground to cover in that, but just honing in a bit more on security's concern for the manual attesting of those spiffs, what were those merits? Like, could you outline what were those main points? Mm -hmm. You mean in terms of being able to identify a specific pod or? Yeah. Oh, uh, we run a multi-tenant system. At the, at the end of the day, a lot of it comes down to being able to understand exactly who this tenant is, uh, both customer side and internal side. We're trying to play both sides of this. So this is the, I guess, industry standard way of doing it at the pod level, and we're doing the same thing inside of our own applications, inside of our own multi-tenant applications, to make sure that you know, the data inside of a, a multi-tenant Kafka cluster, you have only access to your data. So I think they're taking the same design thing or security thinking and applying it to our infrastructure space. I'm not sure if that exactly answers your questions, but that, that was kind of the philosophically the, the angle they were coming from. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. I think that's time. Thank Alrighty. you, Alrighty. Well, thank you, everybody.